even though on paper it looks like the worst thing ever that I you know threw my career away or whatever else on paper it looks bad but in real life I am so blessed and thankful and grateful for for that da -da 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 -da. I do not report on fitness and bodybuilding news on this channel, but once in a while the world of fitness and bodybuilding overlaps with or intersects with interesting political and philosophical questions, sometimes within the vegan movement, sometimes outside of its bounds. You might or might not have noticed this recent evolution in the physique and philosophical perspective of John Venus. Quote, Why did I do this to myself? Over the last two years, I've been losing all my passion for lifting weights. Why do you look smaller, softer, less impressive? Are questions I get asked often nowadays. The truth is, I never really valued my physique or appearance much. The reason I pushed myself as hard as I possibly could was to be a quote-unquote billboard for veganism, a lifestyle I once thought was my life mission to promote with everything I had. Now that I have fully left my vegan identity behind, I find no reason to train like I used to anymore. I have also struggled with being a fitness person, taking shirtless photos that did not always have the effect I intended, inspiring people to eat plants. Even while preaching body positivity and self-love, it never felt like me as I did so while having an unnatural looking body that incites desire, even lust in others, a lower state of consciousness. There is nothing wrong with wanting to look a certain way, but if we are doing it for attention, admiration, compliments, and other vain reasons, there will always be a dark side to it. And I never intended that to be my, quote, career, close quote. So John Venus now has to ask himself some very difficult questions. If fitness, weight loss, and bodybuilding are not, for him, the meaning of life, what is? If fitness, weight loss, and bodybuilding used as a means to promulgate and propound and promote the vegan movement, is not the meaning of life and is not the way to lead a meaningful life for him. What is? What else you got? What have you got left? Who are you really when we strip away vegan activist as an identity, when we strip away fitness influencer, and when we even strip away the body, the body that gave him this fame, gave him this renown, gave him this career, which he refers to now as a quote career, close quote. It was a real career, it was real money, it was real fame, and in its pathetic way, veganism is a real movement, right? Veganism is a message that gives people a sense of meaning and purpose and direction in their lives. But I would be the first one to say to you, this should not be the only source of meaning and purpose and direction in your life. It shouldn't even be the main one, right? You should be leading a meaningful life already. You should have your own passions and interests and political projects and research projects, your own initiative, taking your own direction, and then you add veganism onto that. If veganism is your primary or only purpose, if living for this movement is what gives you a sense of direction in your life, I'd say that's a formula for disaster. I'd say that's a formula for personal failure. I think, I think it leads to tragedy and to tragedy only. I can sympathize with and I can empathize with the position John Venus is now in to a much greater extent than you might suppose. Not because I've ever been a bodybuilder, I haven't been, <laughs> and I never want to be a bodybuilder. I never want to bench press 400 pounds and I never want to have the kind of physical pain and even the disturbance to your sleep that comes with bench pressing 400 pounds. Ooh, just the disruption to your sleep cycle that comes with pushing your body to that limit to get those results. I never want to experience that enough. I've, I've experienced enough with weightlifting that I can imagine. I don't sympathize with them because I have any experience with making money out of my appearance as a model, 
as a bodybuilder. I, I don't have any experience making money giving health and diet and fitness advice. Not for that reason. What I have experience with is having to bring to a sudden screeching halt everything that made my life meaningful just a few months before and it take on a whole new direction. After 10 years as a scholar of Buddhism, I had to come to a complete stop and say, okay, if I quit now, if I give up Buddhist scholarship, if I give up the study of Buddhist languages, if I give up the pursuit of humanitarian work in Buddhist countries, the study of the politics and history of Buddhism, if I give all of that up, what have I got left? And you know what the answer is? Me. If I give up that philosophy, what have I got left? My philosophy, right? And that's partly the philosophy I had before I got involved in Buddhism that I brought into the study of Buddhism with me. And it's partly the new philosophy I have coming out of Buddhism. Part of my critique of Buddhism, <laughs> my repudiation of Buddhism on the way out, right? New philosophy, new perspective, okay? And I'm not going to say it's easy. It was terribly, terribly difficult, terribly challenging transition in my life in every way, including philosophically, including in terms of self-image, identity, body image, whatever you want to say, where you have to think, if I'm not a Buddhist anymore, who am I and what am I, right? And I had to come up with some new answers. Straight out of that experience, I threw myself into the study of Cree and Ojibwe, First Nations languages, languages, politics, history of Canada's indigenous people. Again, something powerfully linked to politics, humanitarian work, this sense of mission and purpose of making the world a different place, right? All of these things, you know, it's like veganism in that way, right? I mean, if Cambodia is just a place on the map to you, that's one thing. If, if Laos is just a place on the map, that's one thing to you. When you go to Laos and you see the bomb craters, and you see the cripples, the people who've been crippled by unexploded ordnance and bombs dropped out of the sky by the Americans that are still going off to this day. Believe it or not, when you go there and you see the poverty and you get involved in farming and agriculture and the, the history and the politics they unfold, and you, you see before your eyes the attempts at elections and making a transition to democracy and you see that transition fail. And I, I worked inside one of the newspapers and you see the way the Communist Party censorship, the government censorship, and, and how much freedom of speech there is, the limited amount. When you see all that and feel it and you're involved in it and you see the fate of millions of people hanging in the balance of these political factors, sure, okay, you know, it's not a book on a bookshelf anymore. It's not a place on a map and it's not just a language in a dictionary. It's not just a task, right? This takes on all kinds of meaning in your life, in the same way that veganism makes the transition from being a diet and being just a set of dry facts about ecology or even being a conceptual awareness of animal suffering to being something that's meaningful and present in your life every day. And then you know what? For me and John Venus alike, all of that comes to an end, right? Veganism for him went from being meaningful to meaningless. This whole thing with bodybuilding and preening and modeling and presenting yourself as beautiful went from being something he was obviously proud of and reveled in, right? To being something he found repugnant, something he rejected. And now he's got to look in the mirror and say, who am I? What have I got left? What am I going to become next? He's got to take on a new direction, find new meaning and develop a new identity, okay? And in that, in that alone, I feel I have something in common with John Venus. When people ask me now if I still think of myself as a vegan activist, you know what I say? No. At what point did Paul McCartney stop describing himself as a member of the Beatles? Right. I'm not a member of any band, right? And the band I used to play with, the band I used to be a member of, it doesn't even exist anymore. I'm not a part of the vegan movement. I'm not a leader. I'm not a follower. I'm not even a member of a club or salon or coterie or circle of, I'm not part of a group of vegans comprised of five people or 10 people. So no, I'm not 
a vegan activist. I'm a vegan. I come on YouTube and talk about veganism because veganism is a part of my life. You know what? As soon as I come on YouTube and I still talk about Buddhism, the extent to which Buddhism is a part of my life. Sometimes I come on YouTube and I talk about Laos or Cambodia or that kind of research. Okay. But there is also a sense in which all of that is dead to me. And I have to look ahead to a further horizon, to something genuinely unknown. And I have to decide and I have to find out what kind of person I'm really going to be. And I've been living uh, my whole life as a people pleaser and as a person who um, is trying to change the way that I speak or filter what I'm thinking about or what I'm speaking about. When all of a sudden you're faced with a massive amount of pushback and hatred um, as a people pleaser, then um, you start questioning a lot of things about your own reality, right? And even though I thought I overcame, you know, um, my attachment to people's opinions, <laughs> it was clear that I didn't because um, I felt horrible knowing that, you know, people who, you know, I, you know, looked up to or who I am, were friends with were just publicly, um, you know, slamming me in these things, right? So it was challenging, but it got me to really do the inner work. I had to realize that the most important thing is to be my authentic self and that I wasn't being that. The clip I'm about to play for you is two minutes long. It may feel like the longest two minutes of your life, but stick with me here. Get commentary and analysis afterwards. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that her reasons for getting involved with veganism, her reasons for becoming vegan, are entirely detached and rational, whereas her reasons for leaving veganism, her reasons for becoming an ex-vegan, have to do with desire, and it's a sense of desire that she asserts as biologically innately real. I'll just dive straight into things. I became a vegan, yeah, like four years ago, and I was driven by environmental sustainability and climate change reasons for becoming a vegan at that time. I was getting my undergraduate degree in environmental science and anthropology, so it was like emergence of like society and humans with the environment and like the main focal point where I researched was on food systems and I concluded that the current food system and where we get our food and how food is produced and the animal abuse associated with that is unacceptable and um, I transitioned into a vegan lifestyle. So I was like trying everything that I possibly could to avoid switching out of veganism and got my blood work done and you would think that vegans are normally deprived and stuff, but I wasn't. My iron was on point because I eat so many greens and yeah, my hemoglobin was good. My um, B12 obviously was on point. Like everything was good. The only issue was the low blood pressure. And finally it was like, okay, I can't keep living with like coming in and out of like consciousness in a way and blacking out multiple times in the day. So I introduced seafood, not seafood, uh, fish and eggs. I just kind of like lived with it and had been living with it until about one month ago when I was at the grocery store with my partner and we both, like the chicken both kind of caught our eyes and he was like, wouldn't chicken be so good? And I was like, yeah. I have so many mental barriers to eating animal-based foods and I have so much guilt around introducing animal foods back into my diet. But then it was just, when the chicken option came up, it was like, I, I really want this. It was something like physiological, but the chicken was amazing. It was so good. I was like, what is this heaven? And since then I have been having chicken about once every four to five days and my low blood pressure symptoms have virtually vanished. Disclaimer. I am not a Christian. I am, in fact, a very vocal atheist. I identify as a nihilist. However, I can recognize that Christian culture and Christian civilization provided people with a certain kind of education and awareness in a certain finite set of themes that is now bit by bit disappearing from our society. So some things that were not just familiar but overly familiar just a generation and a half ago 
are now becoming obscure and hard to understand for a new generation growing up in a much less Christian society. One example of that is the mentality of desiring the forbidden fruit. Objectively, a woman is no more attractive, no more appealing, no more sexy when she's dressed up as a nun than when she's wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. And yet, it was an incredibly widely attested factor in our culture, in our society, in the West, that up until quite recently, there were all of these men with an erotic fascination having sex with a woman dressed up as a nun. Now, why would that be? They were raised in schools, very often including high school, where there were nuns who were their teachers and superiors, who often were mean to them, who often beat them with a ruler, who spanked them with a ruler. They grew up with these kind of oppressive figures dressed up as nuns, females, who were by definition both forbidding and forbidden. They were a symbol of authority, they were a symbol of something unattainable, and of course they might imagine that underneath the nun's uniform these women were tremendously beautiful or attractive. There were a lot of people who grew up with that sexual fascination and then it was exhibited in a kind of lifelong fetish. So this was something Western civilization was uh, not just aware of, but I think everyone was quite bored of hearing about. I knew a man who actually uh, was sentenced to prison briefly. He was actually sentenced to prison because he was a peace protester. He was an anti-military protester, put it that way. But anyway, he, was, uh, he was sentenced to prison uh, briefly uh, as a young man, and he had a lifelong fascination uh, with having sex with women in police uniform, and he once had sex with a woman who was a judge in her judge's uniform, in the judge's robes. Um, it's not deep, but it's real. I mean, this kind of fetishism, this kind of response to forbidden fruit, again, it's something that just a generation ago people would have been so familiar with they would have found it boring to discuss. And yet today, I think it's interesting that we see this phenomenon of, you know, anti-veganism playing out. It seems to me all the players in the game, including pro-vegan critics, they really seem to be unaware of how powerful this type of desire is and how people, um, rationally or irrationally, like either, either thinking it through rationally or without any such steps taken in the mind, they will really assert that their own desires are in fact innate biological needs. This is the most common thing in the world. You know, <laughs> you want something, but you'd rather believe that you need something, right? You actually have a very fetishistic and kinky reason why this woman dressed up as a nun is more attractive to you, but you want to think it's something natural and necessary and innate and good because you don't want to question psychologically why it is you, you perceive it this way, why it is you experience it this way, right? Now, in terms of objective scientific facts here, uh, women who actually choose to become nuns, you know, not not if you pay a stripper to dress up like a nun, also common, also common to pay strippers to dress up as police officers and so on, all these other authority figures, all right? There is no objective sense in which a woman who is a nun is more attractive than any other woman. In the same sense, can we all just agree here, objectively, chicken does not taste good. I'm vegan, okay, but I, I remember the taste, taste of chicken. White chicken breast, okay? There's a bit of a greasy taste to it, and then otherwise it's just salt and it's flavorless. Chicken has an almost neutral flavor. It almost tastes like nothing aside from the salt and massive amounts of salt added to it, and to some extent the grease or the oil if you're having chicken that's cooked in a method that adds a lot of, a lot of oil and grease to it, right? We, we know this. We have been, there's really a sense in which you can even measure what does chicken taste like and why is it that in our culture and in all cultures, all of these sauces and spices and oily batters have to be added to chicken to make it taste like anything at all, all right? This young woman just described to you vividly how she had this response to seeing chicken. You know, she had this response to the flavor of chicken and she then makes the leaps of inference that this was a cure for her medical problems. And it does sound like in her case she had legitimate medical problems, but eating chicken is not the cure or eating chicken is not the best or the only cure. If you have low blood pressure, there must be a better way to deal with it than eating foods you know to be unhealthy, but that can raise your blood pressure. Fried chicken as the cure for low, low blood pressure. What a concept. You should get a peer-reviewed paper on that. This is really ridiculous, right? But I'm inviting you here to focus on and really think about the mentality of forbidden fruit. What is it that made the chicken seem so fascinating? What is it that made it taste so sweet? 
It was precisely the sense of it being forbidden. It was precisely, as she said, her own sense of guilt, of challenging that guilt and overcoming those inhibitions. Millions of people are fascinated with that stuff. And I got to say, I feel qualified to speak on it because I feel none of it. To me, there is absolutely nothing that makes, for example, a Muslim woman wearing the headscarf and veil, that makes her more appealing than a woman in blue jeans and a t-shirt. Nothing. The fact that it's forbidden, the fact that it's mysterious, does nothing for me. All right? My life is about real relationships with real people on the basis of real self-knowledge and real mutual knowledge and real friendship and real common ground. You know, I want a woman I can relate to as an intellectual. I want a woman... All the things I want have nothing to do with this kind of fetish for the unknown, fetish for the unattainable, fetish for the forbidden and the forbidding. I don't fetishize authority figures anyway. I don't relate to any of it. So I feel like I'm standing back with a sense of perfect attachment here. And it's the strange thing that in 2020, within the sort of vegan demimon, it seems to me that I'm the only person pointing this out and saying, wait, these people, these ex-vegans, for the most part, they joined veganism for these very rational, very detached reasons that they can explain in so many words in, in a narrative form, right? And then they drop out of veganism for reasons that are wildly incoherent, that have everything to do with passion over reason, that have everything to do with desire overcoming their minds. And if we go back to the first premise in the case of this woman, oh, oh, so you think all of a sudden you think chicken tastes great. When it has this forbidden quality, when you know, you're know you overcoming the years of guilt and your ideological commitment, oh, really? So tell me something, your entire university education in ecological science and anthropology, is that worthless now? All the facts and figures that you knew and shared with the world and cared about, about ecological devastation, about is, is that all meaningless now? Is that what desire means to you? Or is it the case that your fetish has to take a step further? that you have to convince yourself that this fetish you're indulging in is a physiological necessity, that meat is actually a medicine <laughs> that cures this mysterious illness you made up in your own mind that you have. You have to take those further steps precisely because of this gulf between what you rationally know, what you're ethically committed to, and, frankly, what turns you on. So make sure you give this video a like and make sure that you subscribe to my channel. I would be very grateful. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. I got a simple, straightforward, and fundamental question from the audience, and it's a question I have not seen or heard answered already on the internet. So let's tackle it in a relatively short video here. I was asked, vegan to vegan, honestly, sincerely, when these people go back to eating meat, these people having been vegan for many years, having been committed to the vegan cause, morally, ethically, ecologically, when they go back to eating meat, so many of them experience these transformative effects, whether that's in their sex drive, in their sense of physical strength and vitality, whether it is psychological or physiological, we now have a pretty large sample size. We have a significant amount of anecdotal evidence of people feeling that it's a revelation and a transformation. They feel tremendously energized. They feel some kind of effect when, after being committed to veganism, they go back to ve being uh, they go back to being carnivores. Whatever you want to say. Why is this? This is in one of the most heavily observed heavily discussed, heavily researched areas of social anthropology, okay? It's because they're engaging in boundary-pushing behavior. It's because they're engaging in taboo-violating behavior. Now, not everybody is like this. I myself am completely alien to this experience of human nature. But if you just start reading the autobiographies of historical figures doesn't really matter if they're like politicians or actors or actresses, you will see there is an incredibly common pattern in human psychology, which was like when they were growing up as teenagers, um, they tried to have sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend in the backseat of a car. And the whole time they'd be terrified that their parents would find them or their older brother would find them, that they'd be discovered, they'd be caught. 
and then they remained fascinated and excited by this for the rest of their lives. They became a fetishist for having sex in the backseat of a car. And it just, it just stays with them. Um, there are white people who grow up with a racist family in the American South, and their whole life they have this fascination with being a white person, having sex with black people, because it was taboo, because it was forbidden, because they're crossing a line, because they're engaging in boundary-pushing behavior. There is a very clear psychological dimension to someone who adhered to and believed in and promoted a vegan diet. Someone who either believed this, believed in this as a form of self-abnegation, like they may have thought of it as a kind of monastic vow. They may have thought of it in terms of personal purity. They may have thought of it in terms of a moral mission to change the world, like an externalized mission, where it's not about their self-improvement, but about improving the world. They may have thought about, of it in terms of a humble service to help animals, the suffering of animals. However it was they thought of it, it is ultimately a self-evident kink fetish uh, boundary pushing moral precept violating behavior that they get a thrill out of when they then return to eating meat and the psychological dimension of this I think is transparent and it's it's demonstrable because all of these people can remember what it was like eating meat when they were just a kid growing up with their parents before they'd adopted veganism and it didn't have any of these effects on them. Like, oh, you know, with some of these examples, they've now become like memes on the internet. Everyone's making fun of them. Oh, I ate fish for the first time in 10 years and wow, I had this, you know, amazing transformation in my libido, my sex drive. It often is the sex drive. Do you notice that? It off, both male and female, we've had several reports of this, right? Well, again, I'm, I'm sorry. This is one of the most studied, most talked about things in anthropology. Talk about kind of, you know, boundary pushing and, you know, liminal zones of morality and so on. So liminal, meaning on the limits of morality. Um, I remember I even once read a, uh, sorry, it, it can be any, it can be any boundary that people are raised to not cross. Or in this case, what's maybe a little bit more interesting is that it was a boundary that they probably adopted, maybe as teenagers, but maybe in their early 20s. It probably wasn't a moral precept they grew up with or that was enforced on them by outside authorities. So they believed in themselves. But maybe that makes, frankly, the erotic effect of transgressing that boundary all the more thrilling and all the more satisfying. So look, I'll, I'll use two examples from opposite sides of the, of the globe. I knew a guy who was a uh, boxer, and I forget how far he took it. I think he was in the training camps to be on the Olympic team for boxing. Like, you know, like he was somewhat serious. He was not a world champion boxer. But, you know, he was training seriously for boxing at, at whatever level. And, he, you know, he knew I was vegan. We talked about vegan ethics. And he described to me the scene of him going um, to a farm. It wasn't even really a slaughterhouse with a group of other, you know, young men training to be boxers to drink the blood of a of a horse, like a horse that was to be killed that day. You can imagine this is like a fucking stone age ritual. I mean, this is, you know, let's take it back to experiences people had 10,000 years ago, you know. And you know, everyone doing this ritual, they went, they this was legal by the way. I mean, it's the same thing. People eat meat. This wasn't illegal. This was in France. This is a white man in France. This is a Western civilization. And you know, they went and they had they each had a cup. And you can imagine they're young guys who are in some ways nervous and in some ways maybe cocky and proud. And you know, they stand around and you watch this animal die. And of course, if you if you hadn't used your imagination, the blood comes out of the animal hot and thick. And of course, it's disgusting if you let yourself be disgusted. But they want to seem tough. They want to. They don't want to vomit. It's like probably if you can remember being a teenager and drinking vodka or drinking whiskey for the first time, and it doesn't taste good. You're not used to it or something. You, know, you can imagine there are a lot of psychological elements to this. And this guy told me absolutely, like with conviction, that he got some kind of boost in, in strength and energy out of drinking, you know, horse blood. And as I recall, he did it again. I don't know how many times, but he, on another occasion, it was just uh, it was just cow blood. It was a slaughterhouse for for cows and going getting the hot blood. So him and him and this group of athletes, it was something not unknown within the subculture of of boxers. Now you can do a chemical analysis and say, okay, what is actually in horse blood? Fat, salt, water. I mean, there's there there are some things you can be reacting to there. There's some level of chemical effect. But primarily, 
just this whole scenario, the whole setup, it's obvious what kind of effect it's going to have on you. And it's going to have a lot of the quality, frankly, of some kind of dark satanic ritual. There's going to be a sense of fear, fear of death, seeing blood, seeing this animal, that the smell. If you guys as vegan activists have been to animal slaughterhouses, you know, there's the smell of the animals. They stink already. But, you know, there's the smell of death in the air. It's, it's probably that alone. That Even if you don't feel afraid consciously, you're probably reacting to that and feeling keyed up and so on. And then you drink this hot, salty beverage. Um, and, you know, I read another account. I mentioned it in another video briefly of a young man who was fighting in the Civil War in northern Myanmar. And he went out, and in very bizarre circumstances, he was rescued, basically, by a tribe of local uh, local people still living in, in tribal conditions, whatever you want to say. Local people living in, in very simple, traditional conditions. And to help him and the other the other guys with him, uh, they, they strung up a goat and slit its throat and, and offered him hot goat blood. And, I mean, he was somewhat starving at the time. You know, and uh, he didn't describe it positively. He was he felt really disgusted by it. He didn't want to shame the people who did, did this ritual for him because they were also they're trying to help him back from, you know, he was to some extent dehydrated and starving, and um, you know he didn't want to insult his host kind of thing. But he described how revolting it was, and then he felt kind of dizzy and weird and awful after doing this. <laughs> you know, uh, if you just drink salt water, if you drink salt water from the ocean. You can feel pretty weird. So I also don't know if just the salt content is part of the problem, part of the psychoactive effect of of drinking a, a significant quantity of blood. I don't know. Okay. So yeah, there are exactly two dimensions to this story. On the one hand, there is a kind of physiological, medical, nutritional reality of what's in the blood you're drinking or, or the meat you're eating. That's that's not that complex. That's a pretty short, shallow story. Like, guess what? If you eat eggs, you get a ton of fat and a ton of cholesterol and not much else. There's not a lot of food value in eggs. You know, if you suddenly start eating red meat, you get a ton of salt, a ton of protein, a ton of fat, cholesterol, and other stuff that's bad for you. You know, it's going to have some effect on you, but having a vegan protein shake, you know, I, I, I feel a little bit of a boost after drinking a vegan protein shake because I'm getting some, getting some nutrients. If you just drink something that's full of sugar, you can get a boost from the sugar and caffeine and so on. That side is is pretty shallow and pretty straightforward. But, um, you know, here on YouTube, most people really play it cool. I think you're kind of underestimating how much veganism meant to these same people. And look, I use the same verbiage in a row. You can call them fake vegans. You can call them insincere. You can say they were never really activists or never really cared about ecology or whatever. All that's doubtless true. <laughs> All that and more. They're probably terrible people. But... For a lot of these people, veganism was one of the most meaningful things they had in their life. Give a great example. Uh, Charles Marlowe, complete idiot, complete scumbag, former heroin addict, junkie, by his own admission, by the way. I'm not making any allegations here. Um, I can remember him talking to me and him saying to me in a very honest, down-to-earth way that when he found veganism, he was really searching for something. He wanted something more meaningful in his life. And, you know, not conventional religion. He wanted a sense of meaning, a sense of direction, a sense of moral purpose. And veganism gave him those things. And veganism gives you a self-discipline. For many people, a sense of personal purity. Uh, again, but even just that one word, mission, a sense of mission, sense of direction. That means a lot to people. And then by that same token, violating that, pushing the boundaries going beyond it, wallowing in your own filth, violating the, the laws of, of, of purity that you're taking away yourself, that is going to have, for a lot of people, some kind of some kind of psychologically thrilling element. So look, guys, I mentioned on this channel before, a relatively long time ago, I do not experience jealousy. I do not experience any kind of thrill in violating uh, boundaries for the sake of violating boundaries. It doesn't turn me on. It really it does nothing for me. I mean, all this, you know... You know, there are people who grow up in the Catholic Church, and then they have fantasies about, like, you know, having sex on the horrible wooden benches in the church, and it's precisely because it's forbidden. Uh, Melissa had a friend, a female friend, and she was tempted by this guy, and she admitted, she said to Melissa, but you know what the worst thing is? She said, I know I only want this guy 
because it's forbidden, because I'm not allowed to be with him. She met him in like a workplace scenario. There were various reasons why it was forbidden love. Oh, you know what I remember? I remember saying, okay, now now she's got problems. Now she's that that's that's something you can never satisfy. There are people for whom the forbidden and violating the law is something very exciting. There must be some people who just who just grow out of it. Um, you know, you tell me, what is sexy about a pair of handcuffs? Really think about that. I mean, the pathetic thing about human nature is that a huge percentage of us, I don't know if it's 30%, 40%, 60%, look at a pair of handcuffs and get turned on because people people want to be restrained, people want to be beaten and humiliated and what the... And I know, I mean, oh, when I was a teenager, when I didn't even know what I, when I was like 17, there were fully grown women who wanted me to do this stuff to them. There were, there were girls my age too. There were women around who thought, oh, wow, this is some kind of tall, self-confident guy. Who can, you know, you know uh, in terms of what people get turned on by and what they get fascinated by, um, you know, the human mind creates these divisions and boundaries, creates the division between black and white, or between, you know, uh, Christian and Jew, between, you know, uh, whatever you want to say, you know, Jew and Gentile. I had one ex-girlfriend and she grew up Christian enough that it was, it was a little bit thrilling for her. It was a little bit kinky. Just my Jewishness. You know, I don't think of myself that way. I don't think of myself as exotic. From her perspective, you know, that was, you know, that was exotic. That was thrilling. We even had, there was some first-person testimony from a privileged vegan, another vegan YouTuber here, and she talked about how before she became vegan, just because she grew up with the idea that, like, deep-fried chicken wings were for men, that it was thrilling for her to wear a leather jacket and eat greasy, unhealthy chicken wings out of a bucket. She was doing something that, like, a blue-collar man would do and not something a refined, erudite, you know, uh, woman would do. Like, gender roles and social class roles. The sense of violating a boundary. She felt thrilled by this. She felt proud and powerful by this. So, you know, um, people want to violate boundaries and, and they experience it, I think that is the purest word, as a thrill um it's not taking the peach out of the orchard it's knowing that you're climbing over a fence and stealing a peach and that you have to scramble to get back over the fence as quickly as possible and there's an attack dog coming from you that is the bleak and brutal reality of what human beings want and yet most people are too lazy and too self-indulgent and they don't actually get out of their chair and take real risks in the real world. They don't do some of the crazy things I do. They don't go to do humanitarian work on the border between Laos and Myanmar and have people threatening to kill them. They don't have these kinds of risks. They don't take meaningful risks in their life. They want to take meaningless risks. So I guess you can say um, in a phrase, this is the psychology of, uh, of the roller coaster ride. But... Most people, before they get into the roller coaster, they put on their safety belts. Hehehe <laughs>